it's a difficult message for other people, isn't it? Because, and people say this to me that on the one hand, they're inspired to see you being unapologetic, being honest, yeah. but the backlash that you experience and the trolling and the hostility and the abuse, it feels like a warning to other women. That if they also have the audacity to speak freely in the way that you do, then they will receive a similar torrent of hate. How do you navigate that when especially younger women ask you your advice as to whether they should do what you do and how they should cope with that kind of hate online? Well, I also think it's important to be careful in how we frame this, right? Because I think naturally the thing that gets the most attention is when I experience a backlash, right? So I think people think I'm just constantly in backlash. That's not true. I have 90% support. My inbox is full of thousands of positive messages of either like support or thanks or this, that, and the other. So I do want women out there who might be watching this or watching me to know that my life is not just like, I'm not just batting away just the dicks of patriarchy all the time. Like I am, I am consistently living a kind of rewarding and engaging and fulfilling life in my pursuit of equality. But sometimes there is backlash and you just have to make a decision. If you are going to be someone who speaks out, you have to understand you are going to rub people up the wrong way, people who are on the opposition, as well as people on your own side, because there is a weird amount of competition and activism that I don't understand. <laughs> uh, and you have to you have to protect yourself. You know, I am someone who is incredibly lucky to have not only access to the privilege I do and a loving uh, household that I live in with friends and a boyfriend, but also I have access to therapy, to very, very good therapy. And so, you know, if you're going to engage in this, make sure that you have built yourself a proper support system because it is hard, but it isn't impossible and it's not as bad as they try to make it look. They're trying to make my life look harder and worse and full of more backlash than it is because they want you to be afraid. Honestly, if you even read the articles where they're like, Jamila, Jamila, backlash, it's two, two tweets that they've screen grabbed that haven't even been sent to me, just about me, and they call that a backlash. They want to terrify us at speaking out because, you know, especially post Me Too, we have seen the tremendous power of when women come together and when women speak out. Like we were able to culturally change an entire generation's perception of consent, of sexual abuse, harassment, etc. We've changed beyond recognition because of that. I don't think we're perfect, but I definitely think a, a huge amount was achieved by all of women coming together and just being honest. So they don't want that to happen and therefore they portray my life as much more dramatic than it is. How do you movement create these massive shifts? At least they feel like they have the potential to be sustained shifts. Following the murder of George Floyd, are you seeing a change in the way we talk about race and equality in the media? A hundred percent. I feel like now it is at the forefront of everyone's mind and intention, which is bloody great because it has taken so long for us to get here to the point where we are having this conversation. And, you know, we are still, <laughs> you know, up until the last couple of weeks uh, dealing with situations of such tremendous blind spots uh, amongst you know, members of the BBC, for example, and decisions that they've made around words that they are using on mainstream television with reckless abandon. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot to undo. There's a lot to do. But I definitely feel as though this conversation is starting to happen in a more meaningful way than ever before, because the one thing we've never had was social media. And we never had a generation like Gen Z before who mobilize and make their point so eloquently and powerfully before. So I think, I think this is the beginning of true systemic change. I hope anyway. One of the things I found interesting is the kind of disaggregation of the conversation around racism. You know, we've always been lumped together as this kind of homogenous brown blob. And now people are actually speaking about what it's like to experience anti-black racism, what it's like to experience Islamophobia, what it's like to experience racism against South Asian, and that there are specific manifestations that these different forms of racism take. And I just wonder whether you've reflected over your career or things that have happened or that you've experienced in a new way in this kind of new climate. For sure. I definitely, you know, I think post Me Too started to look back on ways that I've been treated by men within this industry. I'd also, you know, I think over the last couple of years, even before that, was starting to investigate like what, why in the UK I wasn't allowed to do more than just be this kind of it girl that I, that I, that didn't represent all of who I was. I couldn't understand because it's not, I came to America and was suddenly allowed to just indulge in all the different the many different facets of my like I don't know my skill set 
or you know, hopefully soon to be skill set. And I uh, and I always felt very sad about that. And I, you know, I, I reflected on situations where in writers' rooms I would ask if I could do the funny bit or the you know the jokey bit that the boys were able to do, and they'd be like, No, no, no. Everyone just wants to see what you're wearing. Everyone wants to see you look good. Like I was actively denied. You know, there were there were times where I would fight for to have at least one woman in the writer's room, the writer's room of six or seven men, all straight white men. And I just wanted one woman. And after like a year of begging for a woman on the team, they brought in a woman who was a mute. Like I never heard her say a word. I, I don't know if she even told me her name, but she never used to speak in the meeting. So they brought someone in who was technically there, but never used to participate in any of our meetings. So wouldn't fight for the girls. And that was definitely something that I found frustrating. I will say that going to radio for me was incredibly liberating to finally be able to not have to look a certain way. Like it, the whole, you know, you're driving the desk, you have the whole of the BBC at your fingertips uh, and you are having to speak down to a clock. You are live. You are thinking you're just, you're multitasking beyond all belief. And so therefore it's like, if you, you will not survive without actual talent and an actual skill set, and no one cares about what you're wearing. They just care about who you are, what you think and what you're saying. And I think that became very liberating for me as, uh, as a young woman in this industry and then coming over to America and just being told you can do anything, you can try anything uh, has been good for me. And I hope we adopt more of that mentality in the UK because I think we're denying ourselves so much of what the talent we have in the UK. We have some of the best talent in the world and I'm so sad continuously seeing them come over to America and then become huge superstars and us really finding out what they can do. There is, that there is further to go in the UK when it comes to just making sure that we really soak up all of our talent because otherwise we're just giving it away and other people are reaping our benefits. <laughs> it's the alternative McTaggart at Edinburgh. So let's get some real talk about what yeah. is going wrong in the UK TV industry. Cause I've heard yeah. you be very diplomatic and you always say, I love the UK TV industry, but I felt like it was a bit now and I was going to America and to that and there's so many other people of ethnic minority heritage have voted with their feet in the same way and I'm really yeah. curious to get into what you see as to where this industry is going wrong in the UK and why we haven't progressed further from when you first started in TV. I mean the fact that there still isn't a you know like another and correct me if I'm wrong but like a prominent young South Asian woman who's now kind of like take I left six years ago like I would love to see like another kind of like mainstream pop kind of culture young South Asian we need to see that we need to see that we're not I mean it's wonderful to see us in like you know positions of like authority and like fact entertain factual entertainment for example but also there we are diverse I would love for our television industry to for our film industry to embrace South Asians for example I don't think we are diverse enough I still think we are incredibly ableist we do not have anywhere near enough disability representation we sh we are improving as of the last couple of years and it would be wrong for me to deny that I've definitely seen a significant improvement but really like the problem is systemic as David was talking about you know it's, it, there aren't enough people on the inside I don't think I've ever had a black or brown director or producer in all of my years over in the UK I had no, one no. one I'd like I think I had one executive producer who was a, a South Asian woman and she was fantastic and a massive part of why I was even able to start my career in television because she rallied for me otherwise I may well have been replaced with another white person um, but even just having her there made such a difference to my career. We as minorities do not feel safe in a room where we do not recognize ourselves, where we do not feel like anyone in that room has our shared experience. And so, you know, I think it's, it's really systemic on the inside where people are just casting people who look like themselves or who stories that they can relate to. And therefore we're denying ourselves so much color and so, so many interesting and diverse stories. We're denying ourselves the chance to learn about other groups and learn about each other. And, you know, we have this unbelievably politically divisive moment and we have the opportunity within media to remedy that, like to deny that art has a huge impact on the way that we feel about each other is so short sighted. And so I do think that where we need immediate change is making sure that we are hiring we are hiring people who are marginalized and that means that doesn't just mean racially diverse it also means diverse in sexuality and gender and it massively means in disability because we're just 
not showing a world on screen that reflects the world that we walk around on, especially in somewhere as cosmopolitan as the UK. 